Cool, good morning. My name is Dale Humby, and I'm the CTO of Nominini. Today I'm going to show you how we use uh, continuous delivery to give us a competitive advantage uh, with scaling hardware, firmware, and software to help our growing startup uh, meet its scaling needs. As a CTO of a startup, I do pretty much everything that the developers hate doing. Everything from testing, support, documentation, management and HR stuff, um, and sometimes even do some coding. Uh, but it's not always been, uh, I've not always been a management geek. Uh, before I started with Nomanini in January 2011, I put my mechanical education or mechanical engineering education to use, uh, designing, installing, and commissioning a steel rolling mill. Um, and I've done all sorts of embedded projects from electrical um, weather station monitoring, solar heating controllers, uh, irrigation systems uh, on farms and big monitoring systems there, maintenance software, and aerobatic flight tracking software. So Nominini's goal is to, prog uh, to s replace scratch cards in Africa with a point-of-sale terminal um, and do this throughout the continent. Does anybody know how, big the, how many mobile subscribers there are in Africa? Just throw it out there. How many million mobile subscribers? 600 million. It's pretty close. 700 million. Yeah. Um, that's going to grow to a billion mobile subscribers by uh, 2015. Anybody know how much money they spend each year? Roughly $85. That makes the market 60 billion rand, or 60 billion dollars. We hope to capture about 10% of that market within a few years. Now, each of our um, vendors spends about, or sends about $10,000 through their terminal each year. That means we have to manufacture and deploy over half a million terminals across 54 countries and 250 mobile networks that are smaller than cell C. This is a huge job if we hope to capture the market that we want to. Seventy percent of airtime sold in Africa is still sold on scratch cards. Even in Kenya, where one-fifth of the country's GDP uh, moves through M-Pesa, their mobile money solution. We live in a physical world. Phone-to-phone -phone transfers of airtime are still too slow. Scratch cards are easy to use, they're fast to transact, and they are trusted. They've also got a downside. They have to be screen printed onto plasticized paperboard. The unique pins have to be digitally printed onto them, obfuscated with scratch off wax, have to be wrapped in cellophane and trucked. This makes airtime in the developing world six times more expensive than in developed nations. The poorest, most rural communities in the world are spending the most on this essential service. And this is going to be made even worse now that many countries are rolling out prepaid electricity and prepaid water. Our system wirelessly and cheaply delivers airtime directly to the terminal, so it never runs out. It's got a simple user interface. It prints instantly, so it's at least as fast as scratch card, and it's made on our own hardware, so it's especially rugged. This makes it a whole lot more cost effective than scratch cards. Ntulisi is one of our vendors that owns a convenience store in a hut in Kwamashu in rural KwaZulu Natal. Once a week, she goes into town. She buys a stock for the store. She also goes to pick and pay. She deposits money into her account that then pick and pay notifies our servers of the deposit, and we send the money and the airtime vouchers down to her terminal. So, who wants to do a demo? Does uh, anyone want to be a shopkeeper here? Cool. Can you catch? <laughs> Let's see if we can use it. So I want someone who wants to buy airtime. That is real airtime. Cool, the guy behind you there. <laughs> yeah. Score. What do you need? What network? M10. M10. What, how much? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Five bucks, 10 bucks, 30 bucks? 30 rand. Cool. Can you use it? Machine. You've got to turn it on. <laughs> it's supposed to be simple. <laughs> yeah, come on. Press the power buttons on the top right. Yeah, <laughs> hope so. Cool, let me come down there. Yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's limited to 200 bucks. Anyone else? Cool. You guys sort it out. So what happens is once the person prints out the voucher, hand it to the person on the phone, uh, they type in the PIN number, and it's redeemed on the mobile network. How it works behind the scenes... Oh dear, you break it. <laughs> cool. Sorry, I just want to get this a bit bigger here. Yeah. How it works behind the scenes, and I'm going to explain how the banking side of the system works. It's hosted on Google App Engine. Um, the client goes into pick and pay, deposits the money, Pick and Pay's servers do a uh, call, um, one of the URL endpoints on our server, and the only thing that that URL endpoint does is queue up a bunch of tasks. If the tasks queue up successfully, it returns a 200 OK back to uh, Pick and Pay. Pick and Pay can carry on doing its thing. The tasks are small, item-potent pieces of work. Um, each task has a separate um, responsibility, such as sending SMSs to notify the person that they deposited their money, update the device's balance, send the money down to the machine, log the transactions, and update our dashboards. We split the large pieces of work into many small things because an app engine can run the tasks in parallel uh, on separate instances. As the queues grow, uh, if we hit load, um, app engine spins up more instances uh, so the work can run quickly regardless of how much load we're under. This also allows us to do loose coupling between our workflows on the server. Uh, which makes the application a lot more resilient. So if an API goes down, such as, say, the SMS gateway fails, um, the tasks will time out, uh, App Engine will automatically retry them, and when the API comes back up, the SMS will eventually be sent. We chose an App Engine so we didn't have to focus our team on infrastructure. Um, our expertise is being that gateway between physical and virtual vouchers. As well as the automatic scaling and the built-in task queues, App Engine also has a high replication data store. And this uh, data that we use in our application is replicated on at least three data centers throughout the US. So even if an entire data center goes down, we're still able to read and write to our application. Data caching is also built in, so that simplifies our code a lot. Now, I'll be the first to admit that we don't know what our product's going to be like in a few months' time. If you're in Tulisi, living in Kwamashu, your requirements may be different from Stanley, one of our other vendors in Kenya. More importantly, we're looking to see what requirements are the same. The product needs to appeal to a very wide audience across Africa. A classic example of this was some feedback that we got from our vendors that um, they needed a way to secure the terminal. They took their machines home at night so it was physically secure, but their kids would print out the airtime and spend their money. <laughs> so, so we needed to be able to uh, put the lock button on. But we couldn't do this feature because we just didn't have the dev capacity at the time. But we printed new labels anyway. In the factory, we stuck them onto the hardware so our clients could see that the feature was coming. If we got the hardware out there, we could figure out the software later. To achieve scale, we need to learn and adapt through iterative development. And we're building an environment where we can continuously improve both ourselves and our processes. This gives us a competitive advantage in a tough market that allows us to outrun our competition even when we're coming from behind. I've always had the benefit of working in an organization that uh, is agile. Mostly, it's been Scrum project management. But using Scrum in an operational environment meant we often missed our sprint goals. Our definition of done was too broad. At the time, we didn't have any CI, and we had to run all of our regression tests on our machines, our local desktops. Um, whenever we got behind on a sprint goal, we would, the first thing that we'd bin was the demos. Um, we needed to do manual testing because we didn't have a dedicated QA team. Uh, and the only way we could release our software was by selling our units. So I spoke to a couple of Agile coaches, and they suggested that we map out our pipeline. It's a picture of our board, the updated Scrum board, with the pipeline at the top. And it's got things like ready, planned, um, development, automated testing, demos, user acceptance testing, packaging the binaries, um, and uh, releasing to the field and operational monitoring. At each step, we keep a record of how long it takes the stories to flow through our pipeline. We note wherever stuff gets stuck, and we've been systematically reducing our bottlenecks. 
We also only used to deploy at the end of a sprint. Um, but as we improved our automated uh, testing and release process, there became a less overhead to releases. So bug fixes we could push out in the middle of a sprint, and we started doing that. Um, and small features often got released in the middle of a sprint as well. And it soon became official that as soon as the story was done, we'd start releasing that. They didn't necessarily wait to the end of the, the sprint boundary to release our code. Um, the, dev pi the pipeline is also very visual. It allows us to see where work's getting stuck. It encourages collaboration amongst all the team members from development and QA, release and support. Um, and there's a strong link between cause and effect. If I work an extra hour this evening, um, there's a very strong likelihood that my code's gonna be pushed to production tonight or tomorrow. If we're working on a three month cycle, uh, working that extra hour would get lost in the greater scheme of things and there wouldn't be that motivation to work a little bit harder. So having a shorter release cycle has motivated the team to get releases out even faster. But of course we didn't start that way. February 2011, very siloed. We had industrial designers that designed the plastics, the tooling, and got the parts manufactured in China. Had an electrical engineer that was designing the printed circuit board and manufactured the prototypes by hand. Uh, we had two electrical engineers working on the low level drivers for the embedded system. And we had uh, another two in developers working on the higher level embedded system that spoke to the server. And of course we had the server guys and myself. In the tower, of course. <laughs> this worked reasonably well while we were scrambling to write the drivers and the subsystems and get them all talking together. But there became a point where our server code, written on Python and easily deployed into Google App Engine, was done well ahead of our embedded systems. We needed to move the server developers to the embedded team. One of the ways we did that was we started pairing the traditional developers with electrical engineers. The developers taught the electrical engineers how to code properly, and my coding at best was hacking, coming from an engineering background. Um, the electrical engineers proved to the developers that the 8-bit CPU was still around and strong, didn't die out with Pong. We didn't need a cross-functional team. What we needed um, was a whole lot of people that were cross-functional in themselves, willing to learn and do whatever it took to ship our product. This is Garth, one of our developers, knows Python, Java, and was mostly c -sharp .net. Um, So him fixing his printed circuit board with a soldering iron after he set it on fire. <laughs> In the background you can see Zukumi, he's rewarding us with some beers, we rescued him after evenings of dumpster diving. I was initially worried that a team of uh, generalists wouldn't add up to a team of specialists but I found that people naturally want to specialize. They want to continue doing what they love and they don't necessarily want to learn something new. But we're aiming for that ideal T-shaped person, allowing someone to go and deep dive into their chosen area, but we also encourage them to broaden their knowledge of the code base and our hardware. Twice a year, we hand out questionnaires that the developers evaluate themselves on. This allows them to see where they're strong and also where they want to upskill themselves. And we allow them to upskill by pairing, uh, and this maximizes our skill transfer within the team. It also allows us to evaluate where the team has gaps. So if any particular person leaves, there's a lot of cross-functionality to cover that gap. One of the key enablers of continuous delivery is automated testing. There's an argument that says that automated testing and chest-driven development cannot be done for minimum viable product, that it's a waste of time and you should just get your product out there and ship it. Well, it's kind of how we started. Our original boards were hacked together, printed circuit boards. We 3D printed 10 enclosures and our back end was our CEO who used to email the vouchers to each of the terminals. Of the 10 that we manufactured, only five worked and another one was stolen within the first day. But for six weeks, we had the remaining four terminals out in, out operating in taxis in Soweto, getting real-life user feedback. And this is the reaction what we got. <laughs> this has uh, allowed us to find some angel investment 
and turn our Hackaday project into a viable product. But it came at the expense that we had to throw away our entire prototype and all its code. Our real product needed automated tests. No one on the team had programmed in C and C++ since they were at university. Most of the team had never written in, on embedded platform. No one had used Python on Google App Engine in the production environment, and certainly no one had written the financial backend before. We needed to prove that our code was working. Our average spend or our average income for one of our vendors is 1,600 Rand a month. If we lose just a single Vodacom 55 Rand voucher, they go without a meal. They cannot feed their kids at night because we've got a bug in our code. We knew that we were going to learn a lot, and we wanted to be able to refactor in a relatively risk-free way. And the only way we could do that was through automated regression tests. So back to the lock button that I mentioned earlier. I'm going to do a quick demo here to show you how it works. Pretty much press and hold the button, turns the uh, red LED on, the keypad's locked. To unlock it, press the button, type in the pin, and it unlocks. Pretty simple. So how do you do that on an 8-bit microcontroller? 16 kilobytes of flash, 2K RAM. How do you get automated tests working on that? <laughs> well, the way we thought about it initially was you literally had to press the button and see that the LED went on, that it actually worked that way. But what we've done is we've come up with a model where you use RAM as a proxy for the hardware. So that you've got your device drivers, uh, you map all your pins to your device drivers, the device drivers write into the RAM, and the RAM then um, is a proxy for the hardware. So all the higher up code can use that. Um, during normal operations, you press the button, the RAM's updated, uh, the state machine can run and write it back into the RAM, and then the hardware, the device driver reads from that. So to write our tests, we use mocks. Uh, can either mock out the entire driver using things like C function pointers, or pretty much a whole lot easier, we just read and write directly to those RAM registers using helper functions. The code that we have and is uh, it's pretty standard given when then style. I need to come around that way. Sorry, stand by a second. Something a bit bigger. So when you want to do a lock button, given that the lock LED is off, all we do is we call the test, which is compiled into the co code alongside the, uh, the rest of the, the code, um, writes into the helper function, which just sets the RAM variable to false. Um, the test then calls the, when the lock button is pressed, it calls another helper function that writes directly into the RAM. We then run the state machine. Um, that's normally run on a timer in the background. We run that manually. That state machine reads from the, the keyboard variable and writes the answer back into the variable in RAM that represents the LED. And then for the assert, um, we just check that that value has actually been written correctly into the RAM. That way, the tests don't actually have to touch the physical hardware. We're just, uh, we don't have to worry about whether the button is really being pressed or the LED is on. The tests are compiled into the code using compile directives. It's binaries downloaded into the microcontroller. Tests are run on the actual embedded platform. The results are sent through the serial port back up to the computer, where we can view the output in the terminal. Uh, we just pretty obviously see where it's passed and failed. As the test base grew, um, the 16 kilobytes of flash wasn't big enough. We now have to do 23 compiles to cover the thousand build cases or the thousand test cases that we've got. Running the test has become a bottleneck, and that's where CI has become invaluable. We bought the most powerful machine that we could afford, installed Jenkins CI on it, and we used Pythons to stitch all the scripts together. Jenkins runs our automated tests on the whole stack, right from the hardware all the way up to Google App Engine server. The test results are streamed from the serial port, read in by Python, 
Um, it parses the pass and fail and marks the build as passed or failed. More recently, we've uh, parallelized the tests across our different <laughs> hardware. <laughs> it's pretty simple. You plug in a whole lot of USB ports and off it goes. This has brought our build time down from two hours to get a release out down to 15 minutes. Um, we've uh, got on Google App Engine, Python running nose tests, which we've multi-threaded. And we use Selenium Grid across multiple slaves to speed up our front-end web tests. Um, we could get this down to the ideal of less than 10 minutes, but the bottleneck is no longer testing. It's actually the release cycle. One of our core philosophies is that done isn't done until it's operating in the field. But the only way we could roll out our code was by literally selling our terminals. If we're having a slow sales month, our code could sit on the devices for days in the shop without us getting any feedback. We wanted the ability to upgrade the machines in the field so our existing customers could benefit from new features like the lock button. So we wrote some assembler bootloaders, figured out how to download and install the code over the air, uh, and then we'd use a dashboard to send commands from the server down to the terminals. The terminals then log into our FTP server, download the code over GPRS, install it, restart, and you've got the new code running. We use stage rollouts, because after the code has even passed our automated regression tests and our user acceptance testing, there's still a chance that a bug could escape into production. So rather than rolling out the code to all of our devices, we cap it at about 10% uh, of our devices get a new release. Uh, this means we don't have to necessarily, if there's a bug, we don't brick a device that's thousands of kilometers away, difficult to recall. We've also added the ability to turn features like the lock button on or off using our feature flag system. This is built on top of the settings and configuration that we normally use to set up things like the currency and the time zone and our various different banking partners. This decouples the engineering requirement of rolling out code and fixes from the business requirement of rolling out new features. Once code for the lock button has been rolled out, it's not active by default. We have to set the pin through the call center. So the call center phones up the client. They choose a pin number, type it into our features flag system here, uh, and it's enabled. So we can turn features on, on devices by device. The business can assess the customer response and decide how quickly to accelerate our feature rollouts or whether it needs to go back to development. This would all be pretty risky and we'd be flying blind without having monitoring and metrics. Most of our data is, uh, that we upload from our terminals to the server is diagnostics. We monitor things like the quality of service that we're giving our clients, how often the products run out of stock, uh, and also softer things like the usage patterns of our different features. This information is then fed back to the team and helps us with our pro uh, product management. We're using ProdEagle. It's also a free service built on top of GAE. Uh, it's very similar to StatsD and Graphite, except it's hosted in the cloud and it's someone else's problem to run. So in summary, continuous delivery uh, and test-driven development has blurred the lines between developers and QA. DevOps is pushing those boundaries of traditional development to include operations such as database administration, site availability, and infrastructure management. Now we're pushing down that line even further to include traditional business roles such as product management, business analysis, business development, marketing, possibly even finance. This holistic view of delivering value to our customers has allowed our team to influence the culture of our organization from the inside out. So everyone, not just the engineers, is focused on delivering a world-class product to our customers. And it's this model of continuous delivery that's enabling us to scale to hundreds of thousands of terminals that we can manufacture, roll out, and need to support across the vastly different cultures and geographies of Africa. So for those of you who like short summaries to long talks, measure everything, find the bottlenecks, fix them methodically, and start today. Thank you.
Minion. <laughs> Hard loop. Hi. Hi. Given that you're essentially moving money around by making web calls, sooner or later somebody's going to buy one of your devices, reverse engineer your protocol, and try and hack you. Yeah. How are you going to stop that? Um, pretty much I mean, all the communication is encrypted between the server and the device. And on the terminal itself, um, there is, we've got tamper sensors on it, so if it's opened up, then we detect it. And all the code, none of the debuggers, all the debuggers all locked down in our production devices. Um, there is still a chance that people can um, reverse engineer it. Um, the money, the way we represent money internally in the system is more, we use what was called credit tokens, which is effectively a hash representing money. So even if they manufacture these, their own hashes, when it comes up to the server, it's automatically marked as fraudulent and it won't honor those transactions. So. Someone, a determined hacker can certainly break into our system, and it needs a lot of work to secure it. But at the moment, we, that's not our primary issue. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah, the guy in front of you? Uh, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Sure. I suppose the next question is then, you know, what is your spoof protection on a device ID? Because I see your devices tag themselves with some sort of ID. Yeah. So presumably I could pretend to be a valid device getting valid tokens. Sure, but then you also need to have the API key for that particular terminal. Yeah, so that's also encrypted over the, the comms. Um, you're uh, dealing with Africa and our famous international connectivity um, and talking to Google App Engine, which is not here. Um, how do you deal with, with latency and, and broken pipes and things? Okay, so one of the uh, unique selling points of the terminal is that it's able to do offline transactions. So we pre-authorize a certain amount of credits and vouchers on the terminal themselves up to generally a couple of hundred bucks uh, if the person's got that much credit in their account. So even when the device is out of signal range, uh, then they can still make transactions. And that also allows us to make the printing fast, which is necessary to make the transaction faster, or at least as fast as using scratch cards. Uh, so even when we had our app uh, was down, or when App Engine was down a few months ago for, what I think it was about an hour or so, we had very limited impact across our terminals. So it's just due to the caching on the terminal side that we can obfuscate all that latency. Answer your question? Um, how do you provide technical support to all your vendors? Okay, so the, the model that I've described today is very much vendor focused, but for our business to scale, we need to uh, partner with uh, people and organizations in each of the, uh, the countries that we want to roll out to. They handle stuff like the cash collection and also the on the ground support. So for South Africa, we've got our own call center because uh, we're providing that here as a test bed. But as we go into Africa, they effectively building up our, uh, they're using, um, we're third line support effectively uh, for them. They need to supply their own support. They can log into all the dashboards that's set up for them so they can see exactly what's going on and the debug information that we make available to them. If they've got further issues, then they can escalate it through to us. But we won't be operating a call center for the whole of Africa. Are they, um, during the, sorry, the pictures of the devices with the covers off, it seems like there's a patch antenna on there with a GPS, is that correct? Are you tracking the transactions that long wise geographically? Um, yeah, that's mostly used for uh, some value add that we can track where, because our terminals are, are mobile, we can see where the hot areas are for sales, uh, or at least for airtime sales, and we can deploy more terminals into those areas. So we can get uh, a lot of analytics from geolocation. Are they? Um, okay. The device itself, it's got printed stickers on there. 
If you'd like to change the numeric values of the monetary and so forth, if you see that you'd like to basically get a hundred rand or so forth, do you need to reprint the stickers or, you, or are you thinking of going digital in order to update the, the monetary values there? Or how exactly do you expect to scale those monetary values depending on your area or possibly what the, your client would desire? So the, the clients set up their uh, label configuration when they order batches from us and we print those labels for them and they put them on in the factory. Uh, it, one of the limitations of having a very simple user interface and making the hardware rugged is that the labels are static. So it is a limitation and it's not as um, flexible as if there was a screen. But for allow it to be hardy uh, and to drop and survive where these terminals are used, we think that the label is of benefit. Um, the labels can be field replaced. Um, there's a configuration interface on our server where you can say you've swapped the label from one type to another and it will reconfigure the machine in the field. So it's not completely limited, but it is more limited than just the screen. Um, the battery, I see that it's, is it difficult to replace? I don't see a charging port. So the charging is through micro USB. Uh, so the Blackberries and the phones that are using micro USBs are, uh, that's the standard now, so we've made our charging the same. But the battery's internal, it can't be field replaceable which makes it um, also a lot more rugged, makes it mostly waterproof as well, um, just limits the possibility of things going wrong. I saw you had an electricity button on, on one of your terminals. Yeah. Um, part, part of adding electricity is capturing the meter number at the point of sale. How do you deal with that? Okay, so we try to reduce friction at the time of sale. So the pin number that's printed out on the slip is an intermediate pin and then they need to use their phone to redeem that pin into something that they type into their meter. So there's, we've decoupled the actual selling of the voucher from the redemption process, and the redemption is whoever, up to whoever we integrate to. Um, it's a very much a South African problem, um, and our, our market is mostly in Africa. So we will partner with people who, want to, who uh, are selling electricity, and we just sell their vouchers on their behalf. Um, what's the recall process if you accidentally brick a device in the field? <laughs> we beg forgiveness from our call center and ask them to recall it. Uh, it hasn't happened yet. There's been, before we had automated code rollout in the field, we still wanted to do some testing. So we used to recall some of our devices from our clients that were in the, the CBD within a few kilometers of our office. And we would get their devices in once a week, reprogram, and they would be the test, effectively our beta testers for us which they loved because they got all the features first. And they could break to their friends. Uh, but we've been very lucky and touch wood, we've got enough tests that prove that our automated download process is bulletproof. I think in our assembler bootloader, we haven't found a single bug yet. It's not said they aren't there and that kind of worries me, but uh, it has survived many hundreds, uh, possibly even thousands at this stage of upgrades in the field, even with flat batteries and lost signal and everything else. Uh, last two questions. Um, especially considering you're marketing this in Africa, besides for the lock button, do you have any other theft prevention or prevention, or if I steal the unit that I run away with it and pun just start punching out airtime for people and selling it myself? Um, the short answer is no. Uh, the lock button is our primary feature uh, for securing the device. It's also small enough so it can be physically secured. There was a case where someone was robbed on a train station in Cape Town and their device was stolen. And because we got the geolocation of sales, we were able to track where that unit was being used and they sent some heavies to recover it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the front here. Uh, I think that's actually a Zulu word in our case, um, it, it, which means uh, easy. And um, I wanted to ask some numerical questions. Sure. Um, basically, how much does it cost you to make a device, how much do you sell a device for, and how many devices do you have? Okay, so... <laughs> sure. So... <laughs> The, the device is sold, if I recall correctly, about 1,500 Rand uh, for the terminal. 
this is also, there's various different models that we have for the sale of the unit. Uh, and there's lay buyers. There's also 50% discounts that they effectively get if they sell, I think it might be 50,000 rands worth of airtime, then they get half of that money back. Um, so that's very, the actual sales price of the unit is determined by the people that we're partnering with, our, effectively our distributors and our resellers. The cost price of the terminal at the moment is about, I think it's 1,200 rand or so for the hardware. Uh, we hope to get that down to about half of that just as we go to scale uh, and manufacturing in China. The batch runs that we're doing now are very much in the order of two to 500 at a time. And we try and, because we're trying to be agile with hardware, we don't want to make too many batches or large batches that then sit on the shelves. We want to iterate our hardware pretty often as well. And we on about our 30th iteration of hardware. And the major iteration from that is about seven or eight, and then we've got lots of sub-iterations within that. Um, the other question was, how many terminals do we have out there? Well, this is kind of different from actually deployed and operating. So South Africa is a very tough market. Uh, there's a lot of other competitors like Kazan, OneCell, uh, and so on. And they cross-subsidize their units with um, Rika. So it's difficult to compete here. So we, our push is for Nigeria and Kenya this year to get our international uh, rollout going. We've got about just over 200 units in South Africa. Uh, and our first pilots in Kenya is between 200 and 1,000 by the end of the year, and similarly for um, Nigeria. But just because they're so far away, we're trying to put all this tooling in place now, uh, so we've got the processes to support our organization as we roll out. Any more questions? Um, I think we, we're running a bit oh, like okay, cool. So if you do have questions, you catch Dale in the next two days or something. Cool. Thanks very much, Dale. That was flippin' awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks guys.